thank you for tuning in to the Helping You Get There live Q&A series brought to you by Louisiana Federal Credit Union. Helping You Get There brings the experts to you for a unique opportunity to ask questions and seek advice from the top minds in our region and beyond. Joining us today is John Lanza. John is on a mission to help families raise money smart, money empowered kids so they can live happier, healthier lives. John is the chief mammal of the Money Mammals and the author of The Art of Allowance, The Book for Parents, a short practical guide to raising money smart, money empowered kids. John created the Money Mammals DVD and has written three children's picture books to help kids learn to share, save, and spend smart. Money Mammals and everything they do have been featured in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and the LA Times. Now we'll bring on John Lanza. Hi, John. Welcome. And we are so excited to have you back on our live Q&A series this year. Lindsay, I am glad to be back. Always good to be talking to you and the fine folks at Louisiana Federal Credit Union. Absolutely. Um, we have been partnered with you guys for many years and you have provided a ton of resources for our younger members, um, ages zero to 12. And now we've recently onboarded the adolescence program for our teen members. And we um, sent out an email and asked our viewers, you know, do they have any questions about raising money smart, money empowered kids? And we did get some responses and we're excited to share those with you today and maybe answer some of their pressing questions. Sounds good. Let's get started. Awesome. So um, a common question that we received is, is it ever too late to start teaching kids um, good money habits? <laughs> well, it is never too late. Uh, it is always good to begin early, mainly because one of the things you're trying to do is open up a lifelong conversation with your kids. And frankly, as a parent, it's easier to do that when they're younger because you're dealing with kind of very basic concepts. Absolutely. And so getting started early is good. But certainly if you haven't started when they're six or seven or eight or nine or even 12 or 13, there's always room and time to get started. And I urge parents who haven't gotten started to just jump right in. That's very good advice. I know um, I have a first grader and they recently just started introducing the different types of coins to them. Um, I kind of took that as the perfect opportunity to start introducing her to more good, healthy money habits and how she can save her money or spend her money. Um, so first grade, we know the schools are introducing, you know, what's a nickel, what's a quarter, what's a dime. So that's a good opportunity to kind of dive right into money habits with them. Yeah. And I think as a parent, what you want to do is just be prepared for when that time is. Yeah. Because, you know, it's the schools might introduce it then. But frankly, kids can be introduced to money as young as two or, th or they're going to be introduced to money as young as two or three when they're seeing transactions happen. Yes. And uh, and it's good to get those get some because we live in a, such a digital world. It's good to bring out some cash so that they see these transactions from the from the get go aren't magic, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, and have them engage in those transactions. And really what you're doing at a young age is introducing them to the language of money, kind of the same way that we intro we read to our kids when they're young. Yeah. That's providing like that's providing the kind of foundation for later reading and writing literacy. Same thing with financial literacy is Introducing them to the language of money early provides you a foundation for later financial literacy. Does that make sense? Yes, I totally agree with that. Uh, we did have another question come in and it was um, speaking of when, you know, it's never too late to start. But what advice would you have for parents who are starting with teens? Yeah, the best thing to do is we've set up a program so that when you start young, you can kind of transition them into. So we have a kind of a starter allowance than what we call is a breakthrough allowance. And the yeah. difference with the breakthrough allowance is that now kids have more responsibility and they will get their money uh, in kind of larger chunks. So they might be, and this can be different for every family. Mm -hmm. And everything that I talk about here is going to be different for every family and frankly, for every kid within the family. So what we try to do is just focus on guidelines. But for the teens, if you get started, what we do if they've been if they've kind of been trained with the starter allowances, you can have them be responsible now for their own clothes. They can be responsible for any food that they're buying with their friends. They can be responsible for uh, their the communication, the extra money that you're paying for the phones that they're using. Um, you might even have them pay for gifts. 
And again, you may have other things that you're going to have them be responsible for. But one, what's key here is that when they're responsible for uh, the money, they are much more careful about it. So that's one. And then if you're starting with a team, just pick one of those things, right? Yeah. So just pick clothes or communication or whatever it might be. It might be if, if, if one of the issues that you're having is you're constantly reaching into your pocket to pay for, you know, them going to a Starbucks or going out with their friends, whatever that might be, mm -hmm. make it something that's their allowance that they have to control and yes. then move on from there. Does that make sense? Yes, that makes perfect sense. Um, and we actually just got a question from a live viewer and it kind of rolls right into it. It says, what can we do to encourage kids to make better money choices? So you just spoke on responsibility and it teaches them how to be responsible with money. Um, how can we continue to encourage them to make better money choices? Yeah, the best way to do that is to provide, set up an allowance and the reason you want to do that is because then they're going to learn from their own experiences because, you know, from a very young age, we're teaching them some basics. The basics are uh, distinguishing between needs and wants, uh, setting and saving for goals, and then making smart money choices. And yes. the key thing here is being mindful about it because we are always making money choices. We're just not always mindful about those choices. And by giving them control of that money, they will start to make good and bad choices, but they're going to learn from their own choices. Now you can provide guidance, but yeah. I really feel like it's the experience that an, allow that an allowance affords that allows them to start making smarter money choices. You can also introduce things like tactics. Um, for example, one thing you can do is incentivize uh, stuff that you find uh, important. So for example, uh, we used to uh, pay half of the cost of any book that our kids wanted because we okay. wanted to encourage them to read. We'd also introduce them to the library too. But um, this basically, by paying for half, it basically doubles uh, their spending power for books. And we wanted to encourage that. And so you can find different tactics to help them make better money choices. At least, I would say, money choices that align with the values you want to teach them. Does yes. that make sense? That is very good advice. And um, on that note, I'm glad you kind of confirmed that for me because recently within the last few months, um, I started rewarding my two girls for every A, they bring home test folders, right? So for every A they received, I would pay them $2 for every A. Um, and then they choose, you know, if they want to put their money in their bank account or if they want to spend it on a treat because they made awesome grades. Um, so I was just, you know, that was confirmation for me that that is, you know, a unique way to go about rewarding them. And it also gives them the ability to use that money how they would like, but responsibly, of course. Yeah. And the key thing there is you're, you're teaching them to be mindful about their own choices. And yeah. then the funny part is each, you know, I have two girls too, and they, 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 you know, what is valuable to one is not valuable to the other and vice versa. And they can only learn those things when they're controlling their own money, right? And that's right. In the beginning, that starts with allowance. And then as they get older, they start to take on jobs and mm -hmm. they start to learn how to use that money that they're, that they're getting in. And it's gonna be larger amounts of money. Um, but throughout the whole process, what you're trying to do is just set this table or build this foundation so that these, this accumulation of choices that they're making inform choices as they get older. And I think one of the key things is None of this is, uh, none of the, these ideas are, you know, that I read about in the book or we talk about on the website that we probably will refer to later. Mm -hmm. This is not about everything going in the, in the, in, in the direction you want. It's about right. ups and downs, right? And Big then learning dealing experience. with the ups. Yes. Mm -hmm. Dealing with the ups and downs. And it's not like they become 18 and suddenly it's enlightenment and they make every smart money choice, right? They just are presented with much different choices. Right. But now they have a context within which they can make those choices because they've been doing this for a long time. Yes. Yes, absolutely. I totally agree with that. Um, and on that note, we, and I've read up on this as well, but we do have a viewer from Kim. She wants to know, should allowance be tied to chores? That seems like a huge controversial topic when you start researching allowance as a parent. So um, what's your thoughts on that? Sure. So uh, we tend to say that uh, we don't tie allowance to basic chores. So basic chores around the house, we can look at those as kind of like rent. Uh, mm -hmm. That's what the kids are doing to be a part of the family. 
Um, so that is, you know, making your bed, um, clearing the dishes, cleaning your room. It's going to, again, all this is going to be different for different families, right? But those are your basic chores. And the reason it's probably best not to tie them to allowance is at some point, they, these kids, once they get, get to be teens, don't necessarily, uh, aren't necessarily going to have to do those chores in order to make money because they're going to be right. making their own money. Right. And so you don't, they don't have the option to then not clean their room if that's something yeah. that you're having them do. So it's kind of presenting them with a false choice. So just separate that out. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason you want to do this is that an allowance, the purpose of an allowance is it's money that you're providing to your kids, not a handout. It's money you're providing to your kids so that they learn to make money smart choices, set and save for goals, learn about needs and wants, right? And then grow with that. Um, and the purpose of chores is to teach kids that sometimes we have to work and sometimes we have to work fairly hard in order to make money. And so what you can do is you can kind of give them what we call uh, above and beyond chores. So if it's something you might do yourself or you might pay someone else to do that, and again, this will be different for different families, mm -hmm. but it might be mowing the lawn. It might be washing the car. It might be you know, doing some work in the family business. Those are things you can pay them to learn that lesson, which is that work is often required in order to make money. Whereas mm -hmm. allowance, the purpose is it's something that we're providing to our kids to give them a framework of understanding of how to use money as a tool. Does that okay. make sense? Yes, that does. That makes perfect sense. Uh, we want to encourage our viewers to continue to submit questions and we will answer them live for you if we have time. We do have a few other questions that came through um, as people registered for our live Q&A. Um, we have one from Joshua and he wants to know, is it better to use cash or an account for their money? And that's something I've really pondered with myself. Do I put it in their account or do I hand them physical cash? Yeah, I think it's both things. So, you know, you definitely want to set up an account because you want to teach them that, you know, putting money into an account is a is a smart thing to do mm -hmm. um, for these kids, you know, as they as they grow. But what you don't want to do is take too much of that money uh, because that's just kind of it's, to them. It's kind of taking it away from them. Right. So we're trying to empower them. So, you know, one thing you can do is if you have an account and then you set up an account for them, then it's something you do together, right? And whether you're taking a trip to a branch or doing it digitally, you can do it together. Right. Um, but I think the idea of having uh, cash, you do want to use, you definitely want to be using cash in the beginning for your younger kids because you want to do your distribution into the three jars, yes. uh, which is the save jar and the share jar and the spend smart jar. Um, the save jar is for kind of teaching them to pay themselves first. The share jar is for charitable giving. And then the spend smart jar is the money that they can use for anything that they want. And you can take some of that save money at any time and bring it in and deposit it in, in, in the account you've set up. But I think it's important for them to understand that there are institutions that will protect their money and there are institutions that will help them grow their money. Yes, absolutely. And um, that's something we've strived to offer here at Louisiana Federal. Um, we have accounts for our youth kids who are ages zero to 12, and we kind of tailor that program um, more on rewarding them for making deposits and saving their money. And then we also onboarded Adolescence, which is um, another one of John's programs. And this is featured on our website as well, but it's, it's geared more towards ages 12 to 17. Um, and this is where it's really like teaching them um, some financial habits as they move into their teen years. And also, you know, even as they go on to college and maybe that youth account transitions into an adult account. Um, so if you get a chance, just check out our website and there's a photo of it for you there. Um, but there's many, many useful blogs and topics and just quick tips to catch the teen's eyes as they continue to save on their financial journey. Let's yeah, see and I think have... the thing, oh yeah, go ahead, Lindsay. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, we have a question from Sandy and she said, mm -hmm. in this digital world, how important is it for the kids to know how to write checks uh, once they open a checking account? <laughs> well, this might be more of a question for Lindsay talking about the checks. I mean, uh, because in, in my pers my perspective on it is that our, my, my kids have not written a check yet. I have kids who are 18 and 16 and I uh, they may write a check in their lifetime, um, but I'm not sure that that's going to happen. So I think we are. The key thing is 
getting them into the digital world because they do need to understand that digital money is the same as physical money and they need to learn how to use that effectively. And one of the dangers with digital money is just there's the, the lack of friction that's there. It's so easy to spend money in, in our kind of Amazon world. And this is nothing, yes. this is nothing negative um, towards Amazon. I mean, there's plenty of, it's, there's a lot of benefits uh, with a company like that. But one of the, and so this is where tactics come in. So one of the tactics that you can use for your kids, especially your teenagers, because they'll start to accumulate a fair amount of money and so one of the things you can do is uh, you can you can wait. So we call it the waiting period. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, if for anything, you can just set a family um, uh, rule that anything that's over $50, they've got to wait a week before they buy it. If they haven't okay. identified it as a goal, and then you could do two weeks on something that's $100. Again, you can adjust this however you want. You could, for you, it might be anything over $25 or it could be things over 200, whatever is going to work for you. And one other, you can use this waiting period, which is not actually, you know, this is one of the best parts about the process of teaching your kids is you learn so much in the process and then you start coming up with these ideas for the kids and you realize this is a great idea for me to use. Yes, myself, I agree. Right, right. These are, this is like something, and you do, you think about it a lot. Um, and I, I actually, uh, for example, there was just like this shower radio that I was thinking about getting. And I waited a week uh, before I got it because you know, it, was, it was like a $30 purchase. I waited a week on it. Um, so these things are not just for the kids. They really are, are things that you do, do yourself. And it's not a bad idea to share what you're thinking about with your kids because there's a, a lot of invisible decisions or unheard decisions that if you make them clear to your kids, they realize, oh, okay, you're following the same ideas that you're proposing that I should follow. So yes. try to speak to what you're doing in your own life. Yes, absolutely. Um, I feel like, you know, it's so important to guide them in their financial decisions on needs versus want and what they want to purchase and what they may not actually need to purchase. Um, <laughs> and us for adults as well, just like you mentioned, it's, you know, take some time to think about, is this really something you want to spend your money on? And especially for them because they've received allowance and that's a, it took a lot of time to accumulate that. So do they want to spend that large amount of money on whatever yeah. they're wanting at that time? And, and when we bring up numbers, Oh yeah. When you bring up numbers also, you know, I know there are going to be people across the economic spectrum here. Right. And so when you, if a number doesn't work for you, you know, you can adjust that number. So if like $25 waiting a week, it may be in your family, it's $10 makes more right. sense. Or maybe, like I said, maybe in your family it might be 50. So the numbers are less important than the concepts. The concepts right. are really what matters here and providing yes. kids giving them some control and then some experience. It's really that like, you know, there are three ways that financial education um, tends to get to our kids. So there's the direct instruction, which is in the schools or us lecturing to our kids. And I, I think it's important that we have this, this information in the schools, but ultimately direct instruction really only works effectively if you have the other two elements going. And that is personal experience. That's what we're talking about with an allowance. And then the modeling from the parents. And yes. so for the parents, we can adjust our own behaviors to be better models for our kids. It's actually one of the wonderful parts of going through this process is you can take the journey with them. And I think one thing I've discovered, because you, know, that you can use your own money failures as ways of talking to your kids. And it's you can embrace that and your kids will then realize, oh, okay, so making mistakes is part of the process. That's okay. Yes, absolutely. I agree. Because we know they won't just, like you said, turn 18 and spend their money exactly how they should. Um, if anything, they're super excited to have access to those funds and I'm um, sure there'll be some mistakes along the way. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> we do have a question from um, Aaron, and it's what age should you start letting children handle money? And I'm thinking she's speaking on like the physical, you know, money. Yeah, yeah I, I think you could start really early with this. So, for example, as soon as they have an awareness of money, which can happen when they're even two years old, right? Mm -hmm. um, you don't want to avoid the conversation and 
when they're two, you can go into the store. You don't start an allowance at two, for example, uh, but you just kind of you can give them a dollar and they can purchase something and you have them. You know, you're going to walk through the whole process. They're not going to understand how the numbers work, but it's really about them physically holding the money, giving the money to the cashier, getting the change back. Again, they're going to think they're going to think that, you know, a penny is worth more than a dime because it's bigger. That's really not the point. Mm -hmm. The point is just dealing with this language of money and seeing, oh, there's a transaction going on here. And you can talk through it. They may not fully understand it, but it's, it's again, similar to what we do when we read to our kids. They are not understanding at two or three all the language, but they're getting exposed to the language. And as they become three and four and five, now they really start to understand and they are set up to be able to read and write effectively. Same thing here. You're setting them up to have bigger conversations and have more control of the money and just a, just a, a comfort with having, uh, with dealing with money um, and using money and talking about money. Yes, I agree there. Um, I recently experienced that with mine. They wanted to use their allowance to go and just buy a few things from the little dollar store. Um, so I actually handed them the money, let them check out at the register. Um, and I think that's when the concept of, wait, I have to pay taxes came in. <laughs> because um, I had to explain that at the register. Like, even though you only bought three items, it's going to cost you more than $3. Um, yep. And now my 10 year old, she's like, she's telling the seven year old, you know, she's like, well, it's going to cost a little more than that because we have to add the taxes. So it was yep. very important for them to go through that experience and just pick up, you know, on those little things that we may fail to mention until they actually walk through it. That's a, that's a wonderful example. And the other thing is that leads to other conversations like why do we pay taxes and yeah. talking about why you do pay taxes. But the, the thing about that you're pointing out here is the key is that if you sat down and talked to your kids, like, let's talk about taxes, they're going to roll their eyes, how, whatever yeah. age they are. <laughs> Whereas if they're paying the taxes, suddenly they're all ears. So it's yes. these, these experiences are, are just like, they're, they're so wonderful. The same thing happened for us when our 15 uh, year old wanted to start investing, right? Yes. It's, it's suddenly when she makes an investment and the investment happens to go up. Um, she wants to sell. And then you lead to that leads to a conversation about short term capital gains and long term capital gains. And yes. these only happen when you're giving them the opportunity to have to have that experience themselves. And then they're paying attention. Yes, absolutely. Um, on that note, are there resources that parents can utilize to help guide them uh, when teaching good money habits to their children? Now, you have the Art of Allowance book, and then you also have the Art of Allowance project. So can you speak on some of those resources that are available? Sure. So on the site that is available at Louisiana Federal, and we're going to have the links in the, in the uh, available here for, for everybody to take a look, we start with the idea that so overall, we have this kind of art of allowance project with the money mammals. The money mammals goal is to get kids excited about the idea of not just spending because kids get excited about spending, but now sharing and saving and spending smart. There's more to do with their money and it's fun to go about it. And there are lots of games on there and videos, um, printables. I mean, there's so many fun activities. And the whole purpose of this is just to get kids excited about the concept. Then we have materials for the parents on how you set up an allowance. And you can always, you could say, you know, let's set up an allowance just like you see Joe the monkey having mm -hmm. an allowance set up for him or Clara J. Campbell or Pigs the Bank, right? So they're excited about it. And now you take that fun, that engagement and turn it into something real. And then what we did is we added the adolescence program because now kids basically graduate from this starter allowance and the basics, basic ideas of money and move to adolescence. And now they're learning bigger life lessons like the idea of living beneath your means and, you know, opportunity cost and setting smart goals. You know, the, the acronym for uh, setting a goal, you know, mm -hmm. you want a goal that is smart, you know, it's, it's specific, it's measurable, it's attainable, it's relevant and it's time based. And uh, we can dive into that if we have time. But what we're doing there is helping the teens understand and develop the behaviors that they can take into young adulthood and then later adulthood that are going to be helpful for them to be in control of money and not vice versa. That's what we want. That's, yes. that's kind of money empowerment is how we look, we, uh, we look at it. 
Yes, and we want to remind our viewers that all of those resources are at your hand. They're on Louisiana Federal Credit Union's website under youth accounts, um, and it'll link straight to the Art of Allowance website as well. And we have those links in the comments too. But that is available to your young ones and to your teens as they're starting their money, money journey and they start to deposit into their accounts. Um, we do have another question from the live session from Kim. She wants to know how can visualization like a piggy bank help them reach their goals? Yeah, this is a great question. And what we typically do is we use, so when we're talking about the jars for an allowance, right? They're clear because it's kind of like a metaphor for the open conversation we want to have. And um, when you set up an allowance, now when you want to set a goal, it, this it's all naturally happens. You go to the store, they want something, and they don't have enough money for it. So you say, okay, now, the first time you do this, they may throw a tantrum. But this is the beauty of it is they will learn pretty fast that, well, if I want that, I'm going to have to set a goal. So when you mm -hmm. get home, you take a picture of whatever it is that they're saving for. You just you determine how long it's going to take, how much money, well, how much money it is, then how long it's going to take. We're setting a smart goal. With a younger kid, you don't have to talk about it being you could say it's a smart goal. You don't have to necessarily break down the acronym itself. You can save right. that for later. But the point is that the visualization, you want to put that on the jar because then at allowance time, when you're handing out the allowance, they're going to put money into that save jar for that goal. But you can remind them and say, you can get to your goal faster if you take some of that spend money and move it into save. And yes. one note here, like sometimes parents feel like, feel uh, that their kids should be saving all their money. That's not what they should be doing. What they should be doing is learning to use money in the way that works for them. And when they have a goal, they're more likely to put that money into the save jar. But it's all right to have some of that spend smart money. And then when they go to the store, they may want something, you know, whether it's a, a candy bar, a small toy, whatever it is. These are things they're going to learn about through their own experiences. Uh, but that visualization is so is great because it gives you something to talk about at allowance time, something to point to, and say they get some gift money from for a birthday. They could they can kind of leapfrog <laughs> to you know get to their goal closer. And you can tell them, it's like, well, there's your there's your save jar, and there's the scooter you're saving for. You know, that ten dollars you just got, you put that in there. You can get that. You can get that right now. So um, yes. there's just so much you can do with that visualization and using the save jar. Yes, I agree, and I think that it's so important to you know stress the concept to them of save, spend, and share. Um, I know recently I've noticed that both of my girls they have a different money personality is what I'm picking up, and it could just be the age. Um, but I have one who wants to go and just spend any money that she receives, and I have another one who's like, I'm going to save this for college. So I'm starting to see you know some signs of different <laughs> money personalities there. Um, but I think it would be important to, yeah. you know, teach them both all three parts of that share, save and spend. Yeah, it's and I, I see the same thing with my kids. And, you know, it's it's funny because as parents, we sit we kind of like pat ourselves on the back when you have a kid who's saving a lot. But honestly, it's as important, if not more important, that you have this plan in place for the kid who isn't a natural saver. Right. Because, you know, I, I look at it like for for our family, even the way I was and the way my wife is, my wife has been a natural saver from it seems like day one. Right. And we don't know exactly why that is. But, you know, I was not that way. And so I had to implement a lot of these kind of tactics that we use with our kids in order to kind of get my mind, my mindset um, working in, in a way that's going to work for me to be money empowered. And the same thing with our kids. You see the kids who's the, not the natural saver. That's where you really have to work on in introducing tactics like the idea of the waiting period or incentivizing them properly. And you know, if they're not, you know, that might be the kid where you need to put more money. You can match the money that they're saving and you could pay them a higher enhanced interest rate. You know, just use different tactics in order to get kids thinking about the saving um, side of things. Um, and and yes. so that's it's really important to be able to do that for those kids who aren't natural savers. Yes, I agree. Um, so we are coming up on our time. I feel like I could talk with you for hours on, you know, money <laughs> tactics for kids. Uh, we have time for maybe one more question and then 
we will wrap it up and we want to thank everybody for joining our live Q and a today. So the last question I'll hit on, you kind of spoke on it earlier was how do you introduce investing? And at what point you mentioned your 15 year old. So uh, what's a good age to introduce that? Yeah, it, it, it will probably come up fairly naturally there. They may find some interest in it, but anytime, I mean, you know, anytime as, as a teenager, I mean, I've, I've talked to money experts who will teach their kids at seven years old about the idea of investing. Just again, that's really introducing them to the language of money. Um, and so I think anytime there's, there's not a hard and fast age to do it. Uh, but certainly if they become late teens and they haven't expressed an interest, it's time to sit down and talk with them about it. And you do not have to be an investing expert to have this conversation. You know, what you can do is one, if you, you know, you can just, you can tell them kind of what you are doing and mm -hmm. you can also refer them to people that you know, or resources that you know, including what we have on the website here with, at Louisiana Federal, to get them into the mindset of how I might be able to use uh, investing in order to, to take my money and do something more with it. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's, it's, it's a fairly, usually the kids will show some kind of interest in it and you can just set up, there are lots of different services that allow you to buy fractional investments mm -hmm. and this is not investing advice. I'm not an invest, investing <laughs> expert. Um, but one of the things that we did is they can find companies that they might be interested in. Again, not necessarily great investing advice. This is really just for a starter investment. Yes. And then you can introduce them to kind of how to buy a stock and how that works. And then, like I said, if it goes up or down, you can have a conversation about long-term capital gains and, and or losses. And then you can also introduce them to the idea of kind of general index funds so that they understand there's a little less risk there. And you can even set up a fund. So you can set up a uh, you know, UTMA or UGMA account for your kids where you know, you're the custodian of that account for them, but then you can take some of the allowance and funnel it towards that, um, that vehicle. That's a really good thing to do for your kids so that they, they see this idea that you introduce to them younger as in the save jar where you're putting in, you know, you're paying yourselves for you're paying yourself right. first, you're introducing them to that when they have their digital allowance and you're putting some money with a direct deposit um, into your uh, UTMA or UGMA, UGMA account. Well, that is awesome advice, John. And once again, we are out of time, but this has been such a great session with you. And I want to thank you for joining us again. Thank all our viewers for being here and submitting your questions. Uh, we look forward to seeing everyone on our next live Q&A series next month. Um, it's been great speaking with you. Um, and we look forward to possibly seeing you again next year. I had a blast, Lindsay. I uh, can't wait to be right to come back. Yes.